she is gone this Sunday. Plans to return February 19th in case of emergency. Please contact Pastor Mike Schendel at the number listed on page 7. And you can always contact Pastor Janet on her cell phone. Please note that next Sunday, February 23rd, you're asked to wear red, whether it be a dress, shirt, tie, socks, etc., in support of Go Red for Women to promote awareness of heart disease and stroke. And there's information about that in your bulletin in the insert. The Warren Food Shelf needs volunteers from our parish on Tuesdays in the month of February from 5 to 7. Please sign up on the bulletin board in Narthex if you're able to help out. Saturday, March 7th at 5 p.m., there's a fundraiser to support the mission assignment of Daniel Pegler, daughter of Dan and Jennifer Pegler at the Warren Senior Center. Meatball supper will be served, and Danielle will share about her two-year assignment to Madrid, Spain. Free will donation will be accepted. Warren Senior Meals is in need of volunteers for meal delivery. Reservation volunteers age 55 and up will receive supplemental insurance and mileage reimbursement. Call Jennifer at the number listed. Are there any other announcements this morning? If there are no announcements, I would like to welcome Dale Anderson from the Gideons. He has a short presentation. It's on. Yep. Can you hear me way back there? looks like a long ways off. Pastor heard, or Phil and Pastor heard this before, but I um, just the other day I seen a guy was uh, talking to his cat, and they were talking and talking, and he thought the cat could understand him, and he understood the cat, and I just went home and I told my dog about it and we just sat and laughed and laughed. <laughs> I'm sorry for all the cat people here, but I'm um, going um, start with a story here about a guy named Lee. Uh, everyone thought Lee was a good Christian. He uh, attended church as often as he could. His travel schedule was extremely demanding, so... Uh, but he seemed to be coping well. However, one time, at the end of each trip, he found himself either in a bar or having several drinks in his room, his hotel room. One long trip that spanned several cities and time zones, he noticed when a wake-up call came, he reached for a whiskey bottle before he reached for the phone. He realized he was unsure of what city he was in. Still somewhat groggy, he opened the nightstand drawer in hopes of finding some hotel literature to help him figure out where he was. Instead, his hand touched the Gideon Bible. Immediately, he knew what it was. He knew what it meant for him. He realized he was on the wrong road, heading the wrong direction. He took out the Bible, looked at the scripture helps, prayed to resolve to repent. Since that day, Lee has opened his life to the call of Christ. He has served as interim lay pastor in a half a dozen churches, and his skills have been employed in church archive and history management. To those he speaks with, he provides an encouraging testimony of how Christ has impacted his life and forever changed it for the better, not because of the Gideons, but because of the living word of God. It's another story about a young girl named Corolla who lived in South America. She was a middle school student, and she was excited because she heard that the uh, Gideons were coming to her school to give out New Testaments. And when they got to her class, her and another girl were the last two to get theirs, and uh, there was only one left. So they drew for it, and Corolla got it. And over the years, Corolla read her testament. She became a Christian. She married a Christian. They, her and her husband started a ministry. And who knows how many people were affected just by that one New Testament that Corolla got. But that story haunts me a little bit because 
What if there was one less testament in that box? Or what if there was one more? We don't know what happened to that other girl. Maybe she got saved, maybe she didn't. We don't know. So who are the Gideons? We're in over 190 countries and 90 languages. Since the Gideon organization was founded, we have distributed over 2 billion scriptures. That's 2,000 million. The majority are handed out one at a time by a Gideon who could share with the person receiving the scripture. We are unique because we have Gideon camps worldwide. The local people know the language and the customs. They know where the hotels, schools, hospitals, etc. are located. Sometimes local Gideon groups are formed where traditional missionaries aren't allowed to go. Scriptures are being distributed around the clock at a rate of about two per second worldwide. Like two per heartbeat. Still the demand is more than we can fill. We don't just dump scriptures on people. We try to fill requests as they come in. And we're usually millions behind on our, there's millions more requested than what we give. We don't borrow, we print as funds come in. Our sources of income are the Gideons themselves, churches like yours, Gideon cards, and friends of the Gideons. The Gideons are not a church. Our members come from many denominations. What we have in common is a personal commitment and a belief that the Bible is the true word of God. A Bible costs five dollars and a New Testament costs a dollar twenty-five. And uh, I happen to have a couple with. Uh, one is a Spanish. This one is in Spanish. If someone reads Spanish, uh, come and see me. I'll give you this one. Uh, we do give out some, but not too many. <clears throat> One, just one may change a person's life, a family's life, or uh, generations of a family's life. When I was young growing up in a church, I, I liked it when the Gideons came. I thought, who are these mysterious old men in suits? I, I think what I liked most was hearing that miracles still happen, that they didn't just stop 2,000 years ago that God's word is still active and powerful, miraculously changing lives. I never realized that Gideon could be a, a next door neighbor who loved God and loved people enough to share the good news of salvation with others. I didn't know any Gideons growing up. There were none from our area. <clears throat> I didn't know that there was a Gideon camp right in Thief River Falls, a camp that meets weekly to pray for local churches and pastors that places Bibles in all the local hotels, clinics, the jails, schools where we can get in, nursing homes, the casino, and more. Camp that get handed out 700 New Testaments in the Thief River Falls Homecoming Parade twice, 1,300 at the Middle River Goose Festival Parade, and 1,800 at the Warren Fair Parade. That's the most we've ever had, about 1,800 at the Warren Fair. Last summer we handed out in Grigla and Red Lake Falls parades, about six, 700 each. We exist solely for the purpose of winning souls for Christ through the distribution of the word. I have one last story about a guy named Lee. Lee was a member of the Hells Angels. He... Um, he was high all the time. He lived to intimidate people. Uh, he thought being he was high all the time, everybody else should be high all the time. And, um, of course, he wound up going to prison for five years for selling drugs. When he got to the prison, he couldn't stop his mind from spinning because he was coming off the drugs. So he asked if they had anything for that he could read to try to stop, slow his mind down. And they uh, said maybe at the chapel. So he went to the chapel. He didn't go in, but they give him a Bible. He wouldn't want to go in because he thought Christians were all hypocrites. <clears throat> then he got transferred to a prison where there wasn't no chapel service, but Lee had his own Bible. And by then he had 
transformed his mind and he decided to start having Bible study himself. And he had one Bible service on Sunday and then it was so crowded they had two. Then they started having Wednesday night services and then pretty soon they were having services every night of the week. Lee is out now, him and his wife serve in his church along with his kids and his grandkids. That's the generational effect that someone coming to Christ can have. So why do Gideons do what we do? Why am I here speaking to you instead of sitting with my own family and my own church? Well, I believe we're taking part in the Great Commission. Mark 16, verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. We believe the Bible is the true word of God, that Jesus died in our place for our sins and that no one comes unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. I do it because I believe heaven and hell are real. I do it because I believe it's God's will that none should perish, but those who reject God's provision for salvation will perish. Would you like to help? If you do, you could pray for us as we pray for all our local pastors and churches. You could donate today or use a memory or other card provided in your church. I put some in the back, in the basket back there, and there's some in the card, or there's a card rack, I guess. Or maybe you might be interested in becoming a Gideon. If I can do it, believe me, you can too, and you don't have to go out and speak if you don't want to. I want to thank your pastor for inviting the Gideons in, and I would like to thank you for your time. God bless. Thank you, Dale. And I, I don't know, will I be in the back of the church for uh, offering? Yeah, just Should follow I? me at the end. At the end of the service, yeah, I forgot that part. Thank you. Thank you. We continue now. Please stand if you're able for hymn number 532, Gather Us In. We will sing verses 1 and 2. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the eternal voice from heaven, the anointed and beloved one, the spirit moving over the waters. Amen. As we approach the mystery of God, let us come in confession. Trust in the love of Christ, crucified and risen. God who searches us and knows us, you have shown us what is good, but we have looked to other lights to find our way. 
We have not been just in our dealings with others. We have chosen revenge over mercy. We have promoted ourselves instead of walking humbly with you. With what shall we come before you? Forgive us our sin and show us your salvation in the face of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved of God, you have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, poured out for you in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Receive the promise of baptism. You are God's child. Your sins are forgiven. Rejoice and be glad, for yours is the reign of heaven. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, the strength of all who hope in you, because we are weak mortals, we accomplish nothing good without you. Help us to see and understand the things we ought to do, and give us grace and power to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading this morning, Choosing life entails loving and holding fast to God. Moses said to the people, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord, your God, that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord, your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before your, you life and death, blessings and cursing, curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast for, to him. For that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm is 119, 1 through 8. Happy are they who follow the teaching of the Lord. Happy are they whose way is blameless, who follow the teaching of the Lord. Happy are they who observe their truths and seek you of all their Who never do any wrong, but always walk in your ways. You lay down your commandments. Oh, that my ways were made so direct that I might keep your statutes. I will thank you with a true heart when I have learned your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes and not love your The second reading, second reading. We are co-workers who belong to God. Brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For one... For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted Apollos' water, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants, and working together, you are God's field, God's building. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Hallelujah. 
Today's gospel reading is Matthew 5, verses 21 through 37, and as we read this together, Jesus said to the disciples, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. You may be seated. We're going to continue now with the hymn 661 verses 1 through 2 of I Love to Tell the Story. Do 
It seems that when it comes to integrity, Christians aren't much different from the lost. God calls us to be different, a peculiar people, called out and set aside. Different from the world. In our personal and business lives, Christians are to be different from other people. My boy, said the businessman to his son, there are two things that are essential if you are to succeed in business. What are they, Dad? asked the boy. Integrity and sagacity. Well, what is integrity? Always, no matter what, always keep your word. And sagacity? Never give your word. Integrity. We hear a lot about this today, don't we? In this political season, it seems that all candidates want to attack the other's integrity and espouse their own, don't they? They do that because in poll after poll, they see that integrity matters to people when they are voting for an individual to represent them. In the Old Testament, it was forbidden to make false vows. Here are a few passages. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12. Do not bring shame on the name of your God by using it to swear falsely. I am the Lord. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. A man who makes a vow to the Lord or makes a pledge under oath must never break it. He must do exactly what he said he would do. Deuteronomy 23, 23. But once you have voluntarily made a vow, be careful to fulfill your promise to the Lord your God. God's command in the Old Testament, as if you made a vow before God, that you were obligated to keep that vow. An oath or a vow is a serious statement or declaration made with an appeal to God for truth of what is affirmed. You took a vow if you wanted to be taken seriously. God said if you make one, you keep it. If you invoke God's name in a vow and do not keep it, you would bring dishonor upon God. It was much like the practice that we use in our court system. We have in place where we put our hand on the Bible, raise our right hand, and swear that we were about to say was going to be the truth. All the presidents up to this point in history have placed their hand on the Bible when they take their oath of office. In our gospel reading today, Jesus was reminding them of their traditions and of the fact that this was part of what God had commanded them to do. If they would have done what they were supposed to be doing, there wouldn't have been a problem. Jesus had just told them he hadn't come to abolish the law. He had come to fulfill it. To make it all complete. The law had become a source of hardship for many, though, because of the additional requirements that had been placed on them. What had happened was that there had been some sort of confusion when it came to taking oaths or swearing that you would do something, or that you were telling the truth. There were many integrity issues, and Jesus was taking this opportunity to correct the teaching about integrity. There seemed to be some confusion about how a person was to act when it came to integrity. Look at verses 34 to 36. But I say, do not make any vows. Do not say, by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. Do not say, by the earth, because the earth is his footstool. And do not say by Jerusalem, 
for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Do not even say by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. What was happening was that whenever a person made a vow they did not intend to keep, they would swear by one or more of the above to impress or convince the person they were making the vow so that they would keep it. You see, making a vow toward heaven may have sounded good, but the Jewish people had twisted the original meaning so much that when an oath was made and it was broken, there was an elaborate system by which the religious leaders would judge how close the oath came to God as to whether it was a valid oath that needed to be kept. There were whole sections of the Jewish teaching that dealt with what vows were valid and which ones were not. Swearing by heaven or earth was not binding, nor was swearing by Jerusalem, but swearing towards Jerusalem was. The idea behind this was that if God's name was used, God became a partner in the transaction, whereas if God's name was not used, God had nothing to do with this transaction. Listen to Matthew chapter, chapter 23, verses 16 through 22. Blind guides, what sorrow awaits you? For you say that it means nothing to swear by God's temple, but that it is binding to swear by the gold in the temple. Blind fools, which is more important, the gold in the temple that makes the gold sacred? And you say that to swear by the altar is not binding, but to swear by the gifts on the altar is binding. How blind. For which is more important, the gift on the altar or the altar that makes the gift sacred? When you swear by the altar, you are swearing by it and everything on it. And when you swear by the temple, you are swearing by it and by God who lives in it. And when you swear by heaven, you are swearing on the throne of God and by God who sits on the throne. Jesus was saying, you are confused about this integrity thing. You have gotten this wrong. You know, we seem to be confused about integrity also. A busload of politicians were headed to a convention, but because of highway construction, they had to take a detour down a rural road. The driver was having problems with this windy country lane and then lost control of the bus. It ran off the road, crashed into a tree, and into an old farmer's field. The old farmer was driving to town. He noticed that there was a gaping hole in his fence. He went to investigate and saw what had happened. He went back to his truck, got a shovel, and buried the politicians. Since the politicians never arrived at their destination, a state trooper was dispatched to locate them. He backtracked their route, followed the country road, saw the wrecked bus in the field, and looked up the old farmer who owned the property. The trooper asked the farmer where the politicians had gone. The farmer informed the trooper that he buried all of them. The trooper said, did you call a coroner? After all, not all of them might have been dead. The old farmer replied, Well, some of them kept saying they weren't, but you know that those doggone politicians lie. We have come to expect people in our society to lie, haven't we? We expect our politicians to not tell us the whole truth. We can't do anything without first getting a contract written that will bind people to their word. That's the world today, isn't it? The sad part is that many people who profess Christ are like this. How many times have we promised to do things for God's kingdom, the church, or in the name of Jesus, only to fall short because it was a bit inconvenient? Here's one that most of us struggle with. How many times have we said we would pray for someone only not to have done it? Did you hear about the preacher that told everyone to read Joshua 25 for next week's sermon? When Sunday came, the preacher asked the congregation, how many of them read Joshua 25 to raise their hand? A bunch of hands went up. The preacher told all who did not raise their hand that they could go home because today's sermon was about lying. He went on to inform the church that Joshua only had 24 chapters. There should be a difference in Christians. We should not be confused when it comes to being people of integrity. How can we share Jesus with someone if our reputation and actions do not show integrity? Jesus said, yes, there was a culture of, by swearing to God to ensure that the person you were talking to would believe you, that this swearing would give you some credibility, but the practice had been perverted and had caused confusion, and now he had a command for them. Look at verse 37, just a simple, yes, I will, or no, I won't. 
Anything beyond this is from the evil one. Some translations say just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus was saying you don't have to swear by God to be a person of integrity. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Say what you mean and mean what you say. How many of you are familiar with the Dr. Seuss story, Horton Hatches the Egg? We can learn a lot about integrity from Horton. The story is about an elephant named Horton who promises to sit on an egg and hatch it for its mother, Lazy Miss Maisie. As the days and weeks go by, Horton just keeps sitting there on the nest up in a tree. All his friends encourage him to forget the promise and play with them. Do you remember his response? I meant what I said. I said what I meant. An elephant is faithful. 100%. What could God do with a congregation that had that commitment? I want to close the sermon this morning with a story. In Chicago, 1929, a 26-year-old government agent named Elliot Ness formed an elite team of nine incorruptible men to bring down Al Capone's $120 million mob empire. At the time, Ness was making $2,800 a year working for the government. One day, a young man walked into his office, handed Ness an envelope with two $1,000 bills, and promised this weekly if he would lay off Capone. Ness sent the money and the messenger back. Desiring to make a point, Ness called a press conference. Newspapers and newsreels from various agencies were in attendance. Ness told the story of Capone's attempted bribe and Ness's response to it. The next day, the headlines ran, read, Ness and his men are untouchable. What God could do with Christians in a congregation that is untouchable by the world that has no integrity. What a witness, an individual, or a church would be if they vowed to be people of integrity. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Christian, is your witness one of integrity this morning? Amen. We continue now with our next song. Number 517, Lord Keep Us Steadfast. God of wonder, you formed us in our mother's womb, and from Mother Earth you bring forth this bread and wine. We place them on your table together with our lives and all that you have made. Open the heavens to us and pour out your spirit. We wait for your mercy. We long for your peace. We hunger and thirst for Jesus Christ, our banquet of life. Amen. Trusting that God hears us, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Shepherding God, you protect and guide us with your word. Lead your church into ever closer relationship with you, that we might better know your commands. 
Hold fast to your decrees and live in your law. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is great. God of peace, you show solidarity with all who suffer, bring an end to violence, war, discrimination, and all other forms of deadly hate, that we may experience your love through the power of justice. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is great. God of growth, you nurture this community, cultivate in us a spirit of service to one another, and bless us in the ministry we share. We remember in prayer Curtis, Bill, Lowell, Glenn, Jan, Marlene, Pastor Ron Warrens, Tommy, Elise, Betty, Landon, Marla, and the family of Russell DeMeyer. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is great. God of our ancestors, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Leah, and Rachel, we give you thanks for our forebears in the faith, who now rest in your eternal grace and love. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is great. Confident that you are able to accomplish more than we even dare to ask. We bring these prayers before you, believing in your saving grace revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to backtrack here because I completely skipped a page. Um, page four. Response to the word. In Christ, you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. We believe in him and are marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Living in truth, trust, and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Let us share God's peace with one another. All right, we continue now with our tithes and offering. stand. Oh! <laughs> 
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord's table is now open. We will do continuous and one station.
Faithful God, you have kept your promise to us in this meal, nourishing us with the gift of salvation. Now send your servants forth in peace, that we may testify to your goodness and share the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. May Christ, the wisdom and power of God, and the source of our life together, keep you united in mind and purpose, and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Go in peace. Let your light shine. Thanks be to God. We conclude service with hymn number 551, The Spirit Sends Us Forth to Serve. Oh,